Thank you, Dr. Lennon. We are very happy to welcome Claire Kilroy to the stage tonight, um, St. Patrick's Day no less. We're also very excited to see a good crowd here. Um, Ms. Kilroy made her debut in 2004 with All Summer, winner of the Rooney Prize for Irish Literature. This fast-paced story of memory and escape was followed in 2007 with Tenderwire, shortlisted for both the Hughes and Hughes Irish Novel of the Year and the Cary Group Irish Fiction Award. Her third novel, All Names Have Been Changed, returns to Trinity College Dublin, where she studied English and then went on to receive her MPhil in creative writing. Her latest novel, The Devil I Know, which you'll hear some from tonight, is set on the peninsula of Hope, north of Dublin City, where she spent her childhood. Kilroy has been noted for her poetic prose and for the dreamlike mood that grips her often unreliable narrators. Her novels can be described as psychological thrillers that engage with Ireland's complicated economic history, as well as its long-standing literary traditions. She names Vladimir Nabokov and John Banville as two of her greatest influences. Banville described her latest novel as smart, funny, and stylish, and said that reading it, one squirms in appalled recognition of the extremes of greed and foolishness of our time. Ms. Kilroy is also this year's Heimbold Chair, uh, which has given me the unique opportunity of reading her most recent novel by concurrently taking one of her classes in the English department. Professor Drew and Professor Sewell formally assigned me to give a few words to describe my experience with both the book and Kilroy as a professor, which I think they probably meant nice adjectives, book review style stuff like uh, dark, funny, and wonderful, or comic and clever, which are all taken from actual reviews of the novel. But I know that above all, when it comes to words, Claire Kilroy loves verbs. Um, so here are a few of those unsung heroes, as she put them the first day of class, that I think are most apropos. She encapsulates. In The Devil I Know, Kilroy follows the story of Tristram St. Lawrence, a recovering alcoholic and 13th Earl of Hope, who through the guidance of a most dubious sponsor becomes deeply involved in the Celtic Tiger property group. While reading, I was struck by how Ms. Kilroy could capture the personal humanity of Tristram, his addiction, his fall, his search for redemption, while simultaneously using his character to examine larger questions about our addiction to greed, money, and success. She lampoons, ridicules, satirizes. Claire Kilroy is funny, uh, there's no denying that, and in the general I know, she uses her wit to brilliant effect, exposing the gluttony and avarice that permeated the Irish psyche through the late 90s to mid 2000s. Char characters like Desmond Hickey, erstwhile bully, cur current property developer, partner to Tristan, or Mr. McGee, the billionaire financier who professes a wish to invade London with hard currency, exemplify the presence of such a mentality at all socioeconomic levels. She educates. I'm lucky to have Ms. Kilroy as a professor this semester. Um, for the devil I know is a veritable collage of reference to Irish writers, literary tradition, and current events. The novel forces us as readers to look outward and consider both the heritage given to us and that's that which we will pass forward. I can vouch that she's just a fantastic teacher off the page in the classroom as she is in her novel, and we're lucky to have her here as the high school chair. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to welcome Claire Kilroy to the Villanova University Literary Festival. I love Villanova. I think you can see from, John is one of my students, I love John. John is the guy when I ask a question that's too difficult to express in a sentence, he's the one who when there's an awkward silence will eventually go <laughs> and answer it for me and uh, I feel a detonation of joy every time he does because it means there's no awkward silence. But I think this college, I, I've learned a lot from this, it's not like education in Ireland. You teach your students how to be in the world how to get up and give a presentation th like that. Th these, these are amazing qualities. I've noticed when I walk around here, little things, people look at you in the eye and they smile, and that is how you should be in this world. It, it does not go unnoted by me. Um, I, I like to think that I will learn to be in this world a little bit better from having seen how you guys be in this world. Now, that is not a good example of verb usage. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank Joseph Lennon Director of Irish Studies. Joseph, you've just been extraordinary. I have, I've come up with so many stupid questions. 
Um, I come with a, a two-year-old and Joseph has been a saint. Uh, he's, as, as my grandmother would say, he's a walking saint. Uh, he, he has been so accommodating and made us feel at home and invited us into his home and entertained myself, my husband, Alan, and my son, who is um, dangerous. So thank you, <laughs> Joseph. Um, John Imrevar, he can't be here today. He's the acting chair of philosophy who takes care of the Heimboldt. That is part of his gig. And they give it to him because he is, he's, he's just, I can't, there are not enough superlatives to describe how much, he's, he's also fun and he's funny and he, he, he's, just, he's, he's unstoppable and he will end up in one of my novels. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Hubert Wan Tong, I, I, I'd like to give him a shout because he takes care of your international faculty as well as students. He's great and uh, people like that are invaluable. Um, Alan Drew and Charlie Cherry, both of you have had us in your homes and welcomed us and fed us. And I, I don't think you've been in a country properly until a native has, has brought you to their home and shown you this is a, an American home. So you, I have I felt incredibly, incredibly at home here. Um, I'd like to thank my, my, my wonderful, like, they're glossy haired and they're bright eyed. My students, they're so, they're so clever. They keep me on my toes and they are uh, gracious is the word. And as I say, I'm learning from them um, more than they sadly are learning from me. Um, there's a great house comes with this job, so I'd like to thank the generosity of Villanova to put uh, my little family unit in this lovely home and to put all the Heimbolds in this beautiful home. And when I teach on Wednesday evenings, I teach my creative writing class and I walk home through the snow and there's this lantern, it's Victorian lantern and fir trees and I go through the snow, through these fir trees, down to my home. It's like going to Narnia and the home, <laughs> it's... it's it's quite unlike an Irish home because it's properly heated. So <laughs> <laughs> even though your winter is harsh, we've been warm, we've been snug. And I found a few weeks ago, I found a little hidden message that I won't say where it is in case someone else finds it, but it was a date in 2006 signed Carl Barry. And Carl Barry would be daughter of the great Sebastian Barry. So this house, uh, all the Heimbos had told me, I asked before I came here, you, what's it like? And they're like, the house, oh, you love the house. I love the house. My husband loves the house. My child loves the house. My child loves America. His first ever friend, he's two, his first ever friend is an American. Uh, I, I, I don't want to take him home from here. Um, I had a very strange thought, which I'll repeat in its entirety, because it's quite short. I was walking home the other day and I thought, I am happy. Um, that's an unusual thought for me, um, possibly for writers, but I am happy. Um, also, and it's strange, I don't know how to describe how the imagination works, but a, a glorious thing came out of the heavens the other day. Um, spring had started, it was one of your gloriously sunny days, and I was looking at my child playing in America, playing in the sun, and I had an idea for a novel. It's the first idea for a novel that I've had since the last idea for a novel, which was this novel, 2008. So this, the value of this cannot be overstated for me. And I'd like to thank Villanova, because I wouldn't have had that idea. Um, and that idea is very precious to me. So thank you so much for having me here. I'm not going to want to go home. I will be heartbroken. I'm going to read now. I don't have to introduce my novel. Our students did it so well. Uh, financial crisis, two main characters, Tristram St. Lawrence, he is a, the, a member of the landed gentry in Ireland, and D. Hickey, Desmond Hickey, who's a builder. This is set, the part I'm going to read is set pre-bust, so around about 2006. Uh, it's gone mental already, you know, everyone is coining it. Um, Tristram is a returned immigrant. He, he has returned reluctantly, his plane has gone down in... Uh, what do they call them when they're crashes, but they don't actually crash, a near crash? He, 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 no one is hurt, but he's back in Ireland against his wishes because he's been trying to avoid his past. Um, he is also, shall I say, a recovering alcoholic. And uh, he has history with Hickey. Hickey used to be his drug dealer. Um, hotel, right at the beginning of the novel, with the Guinness. Um, I came down late the following afternoon to inquire after the whereabouts of my luggage when this total stranger accosted me. It's occurred to me, I need to say, this is 2016. I've used that date because it is the anniversary of the centenary of the Declaration of Independence when Ireland announced that it's a state. 
This is a banking inquiry. We actually are having a banking inquiry at the moment, but when I wrote this, we weren't. And this is an inquiry into what went wrong in Ireland. I came down late the following afternoon to inquire about the whereabouts of my luggage when this total stranger accosted me. I thought you were dead, he said. I didn't recognise him, but then how would I? He could have been anyone under that balaclava of facial hair. None of the passengers were seriously injured, I assured him. What? I know, absolute miracle. You were on that plane last night, the one that shat itself. Um, I checked my watch. Why else would I be dead? The receptionist put down her phone. I'm sorry, Mr. St. Lawrence, the airline hasn't located your luggage yet. You are him, said the hairy man. I see, I said to the receptionist and thanked her. You're Tristram St. Lawrence, he said, as if outing a thief. I'm sorry, can I help you? The man frowned. But you're dead. He looked at me. That was another Tristram St. Lawrence. He looked at me askance. How could there be two of us? Two men with a name as uncommon as that. Another Tristram St. Lawrence, he repeated dubiously, unconvinced by this explanation of a death-evading trick. I don't quite seem to have caught your name, Mr... He winked. Ah, you know me. I looked at him blankly. He winked again. Ah, you do. I took out my phone and frowned at the screen. Force of habit. When in doubt, I consulted Monsieur Deville. No new calls. I'm afraid I don't seem to... Don't tell me you've forgotten your old pal. Well, I... Then he laughed. And it was the laugh that did it. Watching him laugh at me triggered a memory of him laughing at me many moons ago. It was the act of ridicule that I recognised, the utter freedom he felt in expressing it and my utter powerlessness in having to listen to it. This man was never my old pal. He put his hands on his hips when he was finished. Are you seriously telling me, Tristram, that you don't recognise me because I sure as hell recognise you? I remember you now. We were in the primary school together. That's it, you have me, the little school. He thrust out his hand and gripped mine. Jesus, your hands are freezing. Desi Hickey. Gick, Gicky Hickey. He looked fiercely into my eyes. We might have been making history. He had dispensed those same, same ha intense handshakes even back in the playground, trying to be everything his unemployed father was not, I suppose, and who could blame him? You were my best customer before you uh, disappeared. I released his hand. I beg your pardon. Ah, relax, I don't deal anymore. I have no idea what you're referring to. I checked my phone. Nothing. Here, I'm on my way out to the hill. Come on out and celebrate. He produced a set of car keys and tossed them up and down in the palm of his hand, a purse of gold with which to tempt me. Celebrate what? That you're not dead. I have to fly to the States tonight. Ah, tonight is ages away. What are you doing between now and then? Ah. Uh, too slow. I'll drive you off to the airport myself. I'll show you the hill and then drop you back at departures. Can't say fairer than that. There are a few people who'd love to see you. Come on. I looked at my watch and made a production of sighing to illustrate that the bargain he drove was a hard one. Although the truth of it was that I had nothing better to do. I had lost my luggage and missed the Florida conference. Go on, I said ruefully as if acting against my better judgment, which I suppose I was, but I am a weak man. That is why I needed Monsieur Deville. Hickey loaded me into his labourer's truck, along with the rest of the junk he'd accumulated. Coke cans and crisp packets, chocolate wrappers and lotto tickets, rolled up daily stars. He cleared the passenger seat of debris with a swipe of his hand. I climbed in and looked over my shoulder through a filthy pane of glass. The truck's flatbed was stocked with tools, a spade, a ladder, a wheelbarrow, barrow, a variety of hammers and planks. A sack of grit slumped in the corner like a dozing drunk. I reached for my seatbelt. Glued to the dashboard was a plastic figurine of St. Christopher. Hickey maintained a taxi driver patter for the duration of the journey through the early evening traffic. How are you getting on abroad, Tristam? You keeping well and your da? How's your da? Desperate business about your ma, poor woman. Ah, we were all very sorry down the town to see her go. She was well liked, so she was. Thought we might see you at the funeral, but they said you were too busy. Then, of course, we all heard you were dead. Must be some job to keep you away from your own ma's funeral. I heard you were high up in the world of international finance. 
At this, I turned my head. Who told you that? Hickey smirked. A little bird. I rolled down the window to get some air. I hated little birds. Almost there, he reassured me in case I hadn't been born in Hoth, in case my father's 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 etc. hadn't been born in Hoth. Who did he think I was? Some blow-in? The truck ascended past ponied meadows and heathered slopes until the road crested and Dublin Bay appeared below. Broad and smooth and greyish blue, patrolled by the Bailey Lighthouse. The white thorn was in full blossom and the ferns were pushing through. Better to have been born somewhere dismal, I sometimes think. Better to have grown up shielded from striking natural beauty, to have never caught that glimpse of paradise in the first place, only to find yourself sentenced to spending the rest of your life pining for it, a tenderized hole right in the heart of you, a hole so big that it seems at times you're no more than the flesh defining it. I rolled the window up to seal the beauty out. The road got steeper. I swallowed and my ears popped. He's taking me to the summit in, I realised. And the fact of his taking me, of my being brought, a passenger in another man's car, lessened the degree of my culpability in the enterprise. I touched the mobile phone in my, mobile, in my pocket. Monsieur Deauville would not approve, but Miss Monsieur Deauville need not know. Here we are, Hickey announced as the road levelled out. Here we certainly were. The picnic tables outside the pub were packed with sunblast drinkers, bare-shouldered girls with ponytails and boys in rugby shirts. Silky spaniels and retrievers lay at their feet, panting along with the jokes. A younger crowd had come up, but apart from that, it was all the same, right down to the sparrows flitting for crumbs across the sun-baked flagstones, going about their business as if nothing had changed. And for a moment, nothing had. The sun and the sea, the harbour and the islands, the horses, the, gorse, the horses and the gorses, the beer and the fear of the beer, not a precious thing had changed. Hickey cruised past while I observed the drinkers through the window, creatures in a different element, an aquarium. For a full year I had lived my life on the covert side of a two-way mirror, screened from the ordinary souls, quarantined from their reality studying the lineup on the other side, the blessed, unaware that they were blessed. They made life look so very easy when it was so very hard. Hickey parked on double yellow lines and wrenched up the handbrake. I sat tight. He pocketed his mobile phone and extracted the keys from the ignition. I didn't budge. He reached for the handle of the door. Don't, I urged him. He retracted his hand. What's the problem? Just, sorry, give me a moment. But Hickey never gave me anything. For what? I lowered my head. I didn't know. Hickey pulled the lever and broke the hermetic seal. The glorious smell of stout came flooding into the cabin, pricking my tear ducts and nostrils. If adventure has a smell, if promise has a smell, if youth has a smell, it is that of beer in the sun. Hickey got out and stood on the road. Are you coming or what? I consulted my watch from habit as opposed to checking the time. It is one of the many gestures I have developed, or rather adopted, that make me question whether I know myself or whether I even am myself and not some studied automaton copied from some other studied automaton ad infinitum with nothing at the centre. I consulted my watch and it said that the time was early summer and that I was a boy of 18 again, no damage done. Just the one I heard myself saying. I climbed out of the truck and let the sunlight wash over me. Irish light in May, the magic month. The whitewashed facade of the summit blazed in the evening sun and the, and the stone walled radiated waves of heat. I should have been looking down on the peninsula from a height, gazing at its nubbled coastline from the window seat of a plane, but I wasn't. I was standing right in the thick of it. It was up to my neck. Just the one though. I warned Hickey, and my lips could all but taste that pint. I licked them and gulped down air with the thirst. These are not mannerisms I picked up from others, but ones that are so inherently, ineluctably mine that it is my life's work to break their hold on me. Just the one though, Desi, just the one, I protested as I stumped along. 
though Hickey never paid my misgivings the slightest heed. Let's get that on record now. Gaffney's was cool and dark after the sunny esplanade of picnic tables, like going below deck on a ship. I stood there blinking as my eyes adjusted to the light. Polished wood, glinting optics, gleaming brass, the captain's table. It was exactly how I remembered it. My past life had been raised so comprehensively that I had presumed to find its components raised too. I checked my phone to get my bearings. It was all getting a bit much. Hickey took a position at the bar, anchoring himself against it by an elbow. What are you drinking? He called over his shoulder, fishing a roll of notes out of his trousers. I'll have a sparkling mineral water, thanks. A drink, man, a drink. He peeled off a 20 and slapped it on the bar, then returned the money roll to his pocket, adjusting its position in his trousers as if it were his penis, which, in a way, it was. That is a drink, I told him coldly. Hickey removed his elbow from the counter and stood to attention. A grey-haired man had entered through the bar, entered through the door behind the bar and was taking stock of the premises in a proprietorial fashion. He drew up sharply when his eyes alighted on me. I should never have come here, I realised then. I should never have darkened this door. Look who I found, said Hickey. Christy Gaffney stood frozen rigid, a man who had seen a ghost. Hickey faltered. It's Tristram, he clarified, though Christy knew perfectly well who I was. Tristram from the castle, Hickey prompted him though there could hardly have been two of us on the hill with, with that name. Christy took hold of his polished wooden countertop and leaned across the bar to inspect me. His eyes roamed over my features for a good 30 seconds, an expression of the utmost gravity on his face. Is that who I think it is? He finally asked, and I nodded. He assessed me a moment longer, then the hand was extended across the bar. I grasped it, and we shook solemnly, man to man. Christ, son, your hands are freezing. He shook his head in disbelief at the fact of my presence, as confounded by the sight of me as I had been by the sight of the pub. How is it all still standing? How are we all still here? Where did damage register, if not in people and in places? I thought you were dead, Tristram, Christy confided, and looked around the lounge to see if his amazement was shared but no one else had noticed yet that something was amiss. Everyone thinks you're dead, son. <clears throat> I may as well tell you now. The three of us laughed as if this were a punchline. Nerves, I suppose. For a moment, I felt tearful. Tearful that Christie should have been sufficiently affected by the news of my death to remember it a full year on. I had presumed that my so-called passing had gone unnoticed by everyone, other than my mother, that is. A pint, Christy declared, and selected a glass which he held to the light streaming through the stained glass window for a benediction before tilting it under the tap. Ah, no, I declined, and Christy made a swatting gesture to indicate that he would brook no refusal. Christy knew what the spirit ached for and how to minister to its needs. All men stood equal before him in their thirst, from the heir to the estate, to the layabout son. Hickey pushed his 20 across the counter. Put your money away, Christy instructed him, and set a second pint on the go with his name on it, followed by a third for himself. They're all coming back to us, the wandering souls, he observed, as he returned to my pint and eased more stout into the glass. Two thirds full now, the tension. From New York, London, Saudi Arabia, what have you. The wives go there on shopping holidays now. Isn't that right, Tristram? He raised an eyebrow in my direction without removing his attention from the task at hand. A pro. I nodded avidly. That's right, Christy. Shopping holidays. I'd have agreed with anything by then. By the fucking places up these days, don't we? Said Hickey. True enough, Christy conceded. But you won't find a good pint in Dubai. You won't find the like of that. He selected a beer mat and set my pint upon it with the pride of a master craftsman. Now, he said with satisfaction, we felt quiet to consider the voluptuous curve of the glass. 
Christy reached for a second beer mat and placed Hickey's pint beside mine. You're looking well all the same, Tristram, he said as he topped up the final glass. For a dead man, said Hickey. Christy knocked off the tap. Don't mind that fella. Another beer mat. Christy's pint completed the trio, racked in a triangle like snooker balls. The game was about to begin. We waited for the tumult within the glasses to settle, the chaos that miraculously resolves itself into a well of black topped by a head of cream. A trick, a cruel trick. It never resolves, but lapses back into chaos the second you swallow it. A chaos so calamitous that you don't know where to turn to escape it. But by then, it is too late. The chaos is inside you. That is the nature of a pint. I reached out to lay claim to the one nearest me. I rotated it on the beer mat, admiring its splendour from every angle. That pint was immaculate. Christy had outdone himself. I nodded my appreciation. Christy raised his glass. To the return, son. Hickey raised his glass and I lifted mine. A shake in my hand betrayed me. We clinked the bellies of our charges together. The stout was dense and the clunk was dull. A swell of cream spilled over the lip and coated my knuckles. It took every fibre of my being not to stoop to lick that cream away. I hadn't fallen yet. The other two sank their pints a third down in one go, but I remained contemplating mine with an outstretched arm. My universe at that point in time had contracted to myself and that pint. We were a closed energy system. I've been away a long time, I told the pint. You have indeed, Christy agreed. No wonder we thought you were dead, said Hickey. The pint was cool and pure, tranquil as the moon. How patiently she had waited for me, knowing all along that I would come back to her, that sooner or later I would return. It was only a question of time. Hickey was trying to get me to recount for Christie's amusement. The part he maintained I'd played in setting a cortina on fire. I didn't know what he was talking about. You do know, you do know, he kept insisting, pulling exasperated faces at Christie. And it occurred to me that if Christie wasn't there, if the pub were empty and Hickey had me to himself, he'd have taken hold of the collar of my shirt and belted a confession out of me, for that is how D. Hickey did business. That is how he did business with me. How would you let the man enjoy his pint in peace for the love of God? Christy interceded. Sure, look, he hasn't even touched it yet. We all looked at my untouched pint and I brought it closer to my lips. I had never felt so pared down before, stripped so keenly to my basest elements. My darkest depths were contained in that vessel, a chalice I had crossed the earth to evade, pinballing from one hemisphere to the other, from one continent to the next, in the hope that if, if I kept moving, it would not catch up with me. But now, here it was, pressed like a coin into my hand by those who knew me, those who had known me as a child. This was it. This was what I was, a cubic pint of the deepest black. I was holding my soul, distilled into liquid and aching to be reunited with my body, howling to be poured back in. I brought the glass closer again. I knew this would happen. I wanted this to happen. I still want it to happen. I always will. My mobile phone rang. I'm going to leave that bit there. And I'm going to read from towards the end of the novel. And the bit that I'm going to read was actually, Joseph referred to my reading here in 2010. Um, it was a very strange time in Ireland. We were, um, it was after the, the IMF showed up, which uh, to the Irish mind, the IMF is for developing countries and suddenly they were coming to us and our government were saying no 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 they're not coming no and the foreign press were reporting that they're packing their bags they're on their way the plane is in the air and during this time I spent uh, I think two days here in Villanova with two other Irish writers I was going to say young Irish writers but we probably missed that boat um, Kevin Barry and Paul Murray and the the I cannot tell you how unusual it was. The speculation was of a nature of, will the banks, are the ATMs going to stop letting money out? Will the hospitals close? Will there be food on the shelves? People started buying tins. And a farmer was found with something like 100,000 in cash in his mattress, um, an old man. So during this, 
another strange thing started to happen. It started to snow in Ireland as if it were Philadelphia. It does not snow in Ireland, or if it does, it's, it's an inch thick and the whole country stops. But this was proper, proper snow, the kind of snow you get here. And on the morning that I left for Philadelphia, I didn't even know if I could get here because it snowed so much. And we showed up in Philadelphia, and this is November, and it was warmer here. And the whole time was so unusual. And being able to contemplate my home from a different side of the, of the Atlantic, we even wondered whether we could return home, would the airport be closed? I mean, it was this crazy speculation born of fear. And it crystallized exactly who the main players were in my novel. Um, it gave me that perspective to, to go and finish the novel the way it is now currently finished. Um, and I don't know how the imagination works, but it was to do with being invited here. So thank you. This part, I'm leaping forward. Hickey and Desi, sorry. Hickey and Tristram have become property developers. They've just shown up. The night before this, they have bought a plot of land. They've bought land all over the world in places that they couldn't find on a map because that's what you did back then. Um, and they've bought this, this field somewhere that they're going to turn into Dublin's new urban quarter. Uh, it's not in Dublin, it's somewhere in Meads, but that doesn't stop them. Uh, they're going to, they're to restyle it. And th this is just the kind of thing that happened in, in, in Ireland at the time. So now they're not in the same truck. It's a different truck. Hickey has bought himself. He has imported from your good country um, one of those monster trucks that he's very happy with. And they're driving around and they don't know where they are because the GPS doesn't register this strange place they're in. It's dusk. They get out of the car because they hit something. And they're looking to see what did they hit. And I won't tell you what they saw. They saw something in this quarter that they've bought. They saw something that frightened them. And they've, they just turned around and they've run back. And the other key piece of information is that this is set shortly before Lehman's bank went down. And you know the phrase, if America sneezes, Ireland catches the flu. So they jumped back into the truck. Neither of us said a word, just about turned and legged it straight back to the truck. When we were both in, Hickey hit the central locking button and the accelerator pedal. He didn't stop to shut the rusty gate when we finally found our way out. But what if it escapes, I said, and immediately regretted voicing the question because in referring to it, I had confirmed that there was an it. Hickey didn't answer. Do you believe in God? He asked me some miles down the road. Night had fallen by then, real dark, country dark. No. Do you believe in the devil? Don't be absurd. The quality of his silence made me turn to him. Why, do you? His face was lit electronic blue by the screen of the GPS, which indicated that we were still stranded in a void. Yes. You believe there's an actual man called the devil who walks amongst us? I do, Hickey asserted with vehemence, keeping his eyes on the road. I seen him down at the stake one night. The lot of us were standing around a bonfire outside the cave when suddenly there was this face on the other side of the flames. Standing right across from me and looking at me mate Shane, staring at him like, boring holes into his head. He was black, and I don't mean African black, he was a white man, but his skin was black and shiny and greasy. So I elbowed Shane and says, who's your man? Who brought him? Fucker seems to know you. But Shane couldn't see him. Where, he says. And I nodded across the bonfire, but your man had already went. But I seen the prick. I seen him there that night. A few hours later, Shane was dead. Drowned. Fisherman's son. Never learned to swim. You remember Shane? I'm sorry, Desi. I don't. You do. He was in the little school with us. Did you know he was dead? No, I hadn't heard. I must have been away. They said you were dead too. That was another Tristram St. Lawrence. That's right, another Tristram St. Lawrence. Common name. I lowered my head. Yes, it is a remarkable coincidence. We journeyed for another mile or so without speaking. Hickey turned the heat on full. Perishing in here, he complained, though it wasn't. Moths blundered into the beams of the headlamps. Have you ever seen the devil? No, Desi, I haven't. I think you have seen him. I think you just didn't know it was the devil or that you just didn't admit it was the devil. That's what I think, is it? It is. Do you think he'd talk with an English accent? Please, Desi. Or would he be one of them mad fuckers from Kerry? You know where they hold the puck fair? 
The puck is another word for the devil, isn't it? Isn't that right, Tristram? Isn't the puck another name for the devil? I don't know, Desi. We were going around in circles again, but there was no sun to orientate us this time. No moon either that I could see, and no Saint Christopher, the patron saint of travellers. The dashboard of the new truck was bare. I'd say he'd be English, like you. I'm not English, Desi. Ah, you know what I mean. I'd say he'd talk posh like you. Hickey pondered the devil's accent as we raced along the country lanes. The blackness of the surrounding fields facilitated this strain of thought. There could have been anything out there. Yeah, Hickey concluded. The fucker at the bonfire with the cold black skin didn't look like a Kerry man to me. He didn't look human. I'd say he was English. <laughs> the lane was steadily tapering and the hedgerows crowded in. A scrawny rabble clamouring at the windows to get a look at us. Convicts in a prison van. They dragged their claws along Hickey's new paintwork. Jesus, he whispered. I glanced at the GPS. It was still reading a blank. Where's your St. Christopher? In me old truck. Oh, silence. Miles of silence ensued. There was much to weigh up. I don't think we should go ahead with this project, I finally said. Too late, said Hickey. We already signed. Of course. Last night, or was it the night before? During the night of delirium, we had signed every contract put in front of us. PP, Monsieur Deauville, I had inscribed beneath my signature, per pro, per procurationum, through the agency of, by the power delegated to me as his procurator, his steward, his proxy. Here, Tristram. What? Do you ever feel he's in the back seat? Who? The devil. Stop it, Desi. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, you sounded exactly like him just there. I mean it. Enough. When you're driving around, though, like now, for example, do you ever feel he's sitting right behind you, just out of range at the rear view mirror? No, I said firmly, I don't. Or maybe he doesn't have a reflection. Maybe that's why I can't see him. Or maybe you can't see him because he isn't actually there. Nah said Hickey. He's there all right. I can feel him breathing down the back of me neck. The relief when the first street light appeared on the horizon was immense. A glimpse of dry land to a shipwrecked man. A sign for the motorway soon followed and we hurtled towards the orange glow of civilization. The navigation system started tracking our position again. I didn't care that Hickey was speeding. I could not get out of that black hole fast enough. I do right now, Tristram. Hickey said out of nowhere. We were stopped at a red light at Sutton Cross by then. At least 40 minutes had passed between us in silence, Hickey blessing himself every time we passed a church, and sometimes when we didn't. The cross was deserted at that hour of the night. I was frankly surprised when Hickey had slowed to a halt at the empty junction. I had expected him to bulldoze through the way he bulldozed through everything. Why, having broken all the other rules, had he chosen to obey this one? The rules of logic, of business, of matrimony, the rules of the Irish state, a trail of broken rules lay scattered in his wake as if a tornado had passed through town and then he decides to stop at a red light after midnight. I looked at him. You do what right now? Feel him in the back seat. Who? The devil. I turned away to look out at the crossroads. The two of us stared dead ahead like a pair of mannequins. The skin on the back of my neck crawled like the pelt of a cat because as soon as Hickey said it, I felt it too, felt him breathing on me. The lights changed to green. We pushed on. Motion somehow alleviated it, that sense of the devil bearing down on us, contracting his tensile spine. Why do you think I bought the truck? Trist Hickey asked me at Core Bridge. He was over enunciating his words. I don't know, Desi. <laughs> Why did you buy the truck? I was over enunciating my words too. We were under observation now. We were speaking before an audience because it has no back seat. <laughs> I see, we trundled on. Nowhere for him to sit. I got that. <laughs> he rolled down the electric window after dropping me off. The castle hovered in darkness, a damp slab of stone. I still feel him 
breathe them behind me, though, Hickey stated grimly, inclining his head to indicate the space to his rear, the non-existent back seat that we were both afraid to look at. The window glided up again, sealing Hickey in with his cargo and no St. Christopher to protect him. Happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Thank you. We have a few minutes if people want to ask questions. I know that Claire has come to a couple of classes and she's going to come uh, to more. But if people have questions, you can think of them. Um, I, I have a sort of initial question. Maybe I get mine out of the way, what people are thinking. Um, you know, in, in most of the press about the novel <laughs> has, has emphasized about the banking yes. and talked about the collapse. But it seemed to me, just in listening to you read, that, the, that there's a lot there about coming home also. Yeah. And it, during the Celtic Tiger years, there was a lot in Ireland about the people coming back to Ireland and that yeah. sense of it. Um, did you, were you thinking about people coming back in Ireland as, as I'd, that? I'd in, uh, ish is the answer. It's different. What I was thinking about is Ireland was gone. Uh, Celtic Tiger Ireland was not the Ireland I had known and loved. Um, so it was almost my hymn. There's a novel that preceded this set in the recession, or yet yeah, the 80s recession, which was a, a, a sort of archeological enterprise on my part to describe the Dublin that had been destroyed by the Celtic Tiger. We became very ashamed to be Irish um, around then, and you had to eradicate your Irishness to say we were always wealthy, you know, we always drove these cars, we always bought big houses, we were never poor. Um, and I, I, was, I was talking to the class earlier today, um, that, that awful man who's very funny, uh, Clarkson, what's his name, the car guy, uh, Jeremy Clarkson, um, he, oh, he, uh, he's just been fired from the BBC for insulting yeah. whole races, but he came to Ireland during the boom at some show and he says, hey, last time I was here, the girls all had white skin. I don't know why I'm giving him an American accent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> probably because I can't do a British one or an American one. Anyway, um, the last time I was here, the girls all had white skin and orange hair. Now they all have orange skin and white hair. And it's true, the Irish started trying to look like a different race, you know, and the fake tan and blonde hair, which is not the Irish, you know, natural look. And I, it, I was trying to write about what I'd lost. I'd lost Ireland. I felt like an immigrant when, you know, I, I, I felt that I was a stranger, only I couldn't go back at all because the, there was no Ireland to come back to. That time is over and now I feel home again. I love the way the country's become and now it's, 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 it's somehow, miraculously, we're, we're on the up all of a sudden. So um, I'm very at peace, which is probably not good for art, but um, <laughs> it, it's, I, I think... It might be, though. Well, we don't know. We'll find out in five years. <laughs> Other questions? Mary? But did I use the word balls? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you why that came about because I think if you are, I started out as a young woman writing books and young female voices and people would say, you know the bit where you did blah, blah and I would go, no, the bit where the narrator did blah, blah and they go, oh yeah, yeah, the narrator but you know the bit where you and it just for my own freedom, for me to say I am, um, an imagining consciousness um, to, to move to the male voice uh, made me free. And I ended up writing two male voices in a row uh, where no one can confuse me or mm -hmm. those people's thoughts with mine. It just liberated me personally. Um, and I think I'm actually ready to go back to a female voice, but I, I needed to do that. It's part of, we all have our crosses to bear, and mine was I had to speak like a man for a while. But <laughs> it, it's over. Kathy? You were saying that um, the next novel beginning with a, a glimpse of looking at your child playing with time. I'm just wondering if you talk about maybe how this one began. Was there a similar glimpse and how did it, how did it 
there were I'm not the kind of person who sees the overall picture and runs to my desk and writes it out. It's, it's a series of minor, minor glimpses. This novel um, started out being in Hickey's voice. I, it, it, I, I was still angry. And by the time I started this novel, the recession had kicked in and I'd moved to sadness. So it was, OK, who were the architects of this boom that crashed so horribly and punished us all so thoroughly? And for some reason, the Irish as a nation took this punishment. There were no riots, nothing. Um, and the first, I ended up writing it in the voice of Hickey, uh, because Hickey is one of the morons who, who engineered it. And they, 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 OK, I don't like calling people morons, but they were people who were not blessed with uh, regret or foresight or hindsight or, well, they, they still don't have hindsight. Um, they, were, they were people who had short-term goals. So that was not going to work for the novel, and it, it moved to a, a more uh, regretful, remorseful, contemplative voice. Um, the alcoholic voice came from a, a, a really weird conversation I had with someone who I knew who was a recovering alcoholic, and it was a very tricky situation, tricky personal situation, and I was only handling it on the phone. I wasn't seeing what was going on, and this voice was saying things that were strange. And then afterwards, when I thought about it, I thought, he's repeating the mantras, and there's a sponsor, and he may have been beside him. I think there were two people on the phone call. And that became very interesting to me, coaching someone, someone being coached to be told what to think. And that informed Monsieur Deauville, who is Tristram's sponsor in AA. Um, and then the, 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 I just, who, tri who, who these people actually were, that I, I don't remember how that fell into place, but just did with a real like, ah, oh, hooray. Because sometimes if you sit at your desk long enough, the imagination will give you a gift. You know, I talk about the imagination as a cat. You can't train it. But if you're nice to it and keep a nice warm house or you know, feed it, the cat might come sit in your lap and might start saying stuff. But you, know, uh, you can't, as I say, it's not a dog. A dog you can train. Um, a cat, you just really have to make the circumstances felicitous for it. A strange thing, the imagination. At the back. How did you choose the title? And at what point uh, while writing did you choose it? Oh, Christ, titles. Oh, if you knew the, the battles that go on with, e with the editors over titles. Um, I just, eventually, you, I, I, I don't even remember that one being chosen. I just, I have such a fear now of titles that, I, and they still call, it's called The Devil I Know, and everyone calls it The Devil You Know. It, it, it's, it's tricky, but that, <laughs> the way the last few books have written, apart, I had one title they loved, Tender War. That was my second novel, and everyone was on board with that. But after this, so it turns into this process of submitting 20 titles, and we haggle. <laughs> so I'm sorry I don't have a, a catchy story about that, but it was haggling with a, 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 a wonderful London editor. He's actually got an Irish father. Um, but he goes, no. He says, no, a lot. No. <laughs> no, no, don't like that. No. <laughs> and that's how we eventually arrived at The Devil I Know. Um, it didn't get as ugly as it did with the, the one that pre pre not predeceased, it preceded it was um, All Names Have Been Changed. That got its name on the last day of like click send, final draft. It's called All Names Have Been Changed after like just fighting the whole time with them. So again, it's the imagination giving you a, a title. I still don't know if The Devil I Know was a particularly, you know, I don't know. What I did like is they wrote a really awful blurb. You know what a blurb is, the stuff on the back of, of a book. And they wrote their usual awful, awful blurb. And I wrote a riddle and said, here, put that on the back. So there's a, a kind of limerick thing on the back of it instead of the usual, these characters are blah, blah, um, which authors don't generally write them. We have two questions, so one here um, at the back, so you first. Well, when I was reading it, I found that like, every five or so words, there was, a, you know, a dab or snark comment or whatever. And I, I thought if I was writing this, I would struggle a lot just trying to pack all of these, I don't think jokes, but they pretty much were. Yeah. Way, or did it come naturally? 
Um, maybe I'm a snarky, barbed <laughs> individual who <laughs> every five lines I come out with something <laughs> mean. Um, I'll tell you what there is in it that a, a, an American audience won't be familiar with, but an Irish audience would be painfully familiar with. I've interwoven loads of quotes from politicians um, and financial regulators and all the rest of it who kept reassuring us that there's nothing to see here, folks. This is all fine. Um, so there's things like that. But um, no, I actually, I really, I really kind of had fun with the... D. Hickey character in particular, um, he's the builder and I thought of my class in primary school, so you know, with all the little kids, and I thought of who would be the likeliest one to ruin a country, and that was, <laughs> we called him Ra, which is he, Rat, his, I won't give a surname, but a shortened version was Ra, and so Ra, I just put Rat as an adult in the driving seat, and uh, um, contrasted him with, with the, the the poshest man in the country sort of thing. And I, I kind of had fun, you know? Um, yes, I must be a snarky person. <laughs> <laughs> it's my medium. Uh, and there was a, a, a question, yeah? Um, when you started this book, I guess you had to struggle with as well. Did you know how it would end when you began? Or was it more of a process where as you wrote, you figured out the plot? Uh, things were unfolding, but I did start it when the word recession was used. And I had, I really had, it's funny, in Ireland, there, there was regularly pieces in, in the newspaper or on arts shows saying Irish writers have failed to respond to the boom. Um, or they did, commercial Irish writers did, there was the Irish um, women's fiction in particular was able to reflect the shopping and the, the champagne and, and, you know, set stories against that. And Irish writers started writing about the past you know, there's a lot of books set in the 50s Ireland. You know, I suppose in many ways what I'm doing, I went back for the book that preceded this to the 80s because I understood it. And I, I did not understand the boom. It was like living in, what was the valley of the, uh, what's the one where they're, they're all changelings? The, the women, the housewives are all separate wives. Separate wives. I felt it was like everyone had had, a, had some sort of... A, not a lobotomy because they weren't stupid, but they were different and the, the dialogue was different. The national conversation was different and I wasn't part of it. And I, I couldn't write about it. And I, I can't speak for any other literary arts writer, but they didn't write about it either. So it was only when the witch was declared dead, you know, ding dong, dell, the witch is dead. The recession is, or the, the boom is over. That's when I began to be able to describe it. Because we did not know it was going to die. This was the new reality. It really, if you're in an economic boom, you just assume things will improve and that it'll always be that way. It, you never think this is going to end and it's going to end really badly and people are going to get hurt and the suicide rate's going to shoot up. You don't think that because everyone is saying otherwise to you. Now we all realise that there were powers at play. Um, powers that, you know, things like the market. Like I tried to, like, what is the market? It's like the market wants you to sell your bonds. The market wants you to to not sell your bonds. And we ran around following what we thought the market wanted us to do. So I suppose I was trying to go, who is the market? Um, and things like Monsieur Deville was linked into a way of trying to understand the, uh, what to me is ununderstandable. I hope that answers your question. Everybody, could we give Claire a giant round of applause? Thank you. Thanks, Joseph. Thank you.